Welcome to worship. We thank the Lord that you're here. and We pray to God that you're truly blessed as we gather here around his word. And just to start with a few announcements, uh, just so you know in this uh, most unusual time, the things that are in place in order to keep us safe. Uh, one thing is our cleaning regimen. Uh, we have our ushers and greeters who have wonderfully extended uh, their service to also become our cleaners and sanitizers. And so in between uh, every worship service that we hold in the sanctuary, we spray and wipe everything down. Uh, we 
are blessed with a great uh, air ventilation system. We have increased during this time the amount of air that comes in from the outside, uh, again, for our benefit. But as we know, uh, one of the greatest things we can do uh, now is very simple. It's, it's to use the uh, masks that we have. And if you came without a mask, uh, we do have extras out here for you. I would strongly uh, encourage you uh, that whenever we're singing together, that that's a moment to mask up, again, out of care and concern uh, for those who are around us. We are so thankful that you are here this day, and we pray that uh, this time of worship is a blessing to you. I, I'm thinking this morning about uh, in the Old Testament when we uh, read about the Israelites being scattered all over in this difficult time, and then as they begin to come back, uh, to the Lord and come back together. They didn't all come at the same time. And today, I am so excited to look over and see the face of my friend Jamal, uh, who is uh, back with us in the praise team, and we're so glad to have him. And I'm so uh, grateful to see all of you, and I just pray that the Lord blesses us as we gather here. We continue now with our song of celebration. among yourselves, which is yours in Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is a servant of all, and we have been made 
to serve. Bring now our prayers before the Lord, if you will please join me in prayer. Knowing the one in whom we trust, and with the help of the Holy Spirit living within us, we offer our prayers this day for the church, for the world, for everyone in need. 
Father, increase the faith of your church. Give us courage where we are reticent in sharing your love. Renew in us your holy calling according to your own purpose and grace. Lord, destruction and violence are ever before us, and the strife and contention rise up within our community and throughout our nation. Draw to yourself all the people of this world, emboldening them to strive for peaceful and just solutions to every conflict. God, you promise life and wholeness to all those who wait patiently for you. And you hear those who cry out to you for help. Heal the sick. Bind up the brokenhearted. Attend to all in need of your care. Lord, this day, we pray for our president and for the first lady of this nation. We pray for all those across this nation and throughout this world who've been impacted by this virus. And Lord, as we wait on a cure, we pray that we will work well together to the blessing of one another. Dear Father, we lift up to you little Axel James Dean, a baby with maybe the coolest name ever, God, and we pray right now that as he needs your strength and your healing hand, that you will deliver it. Father, we continue to lift up our brothers and sisters who are hurting as we call out to you for George and Audrey, for Bruce. We pray for Tom, for Jean and Kathy and Jim and Rosa and Jackie and Kim. Lord, we pray for Carl and for Shelly, for Maggie, for Casey and Karen, for Tanisha, for Marlene. Dear God, we call out to you now with the names of those who are on our heart. Lord, you are our hope and strength. We pray your healing hand upon all who are struggling uh, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Rekindle your gift of love in this community. Bind together in Christ the weak with the strong, those with little faith with those with much. Help us to respond to one another with Christ-like compassion. We remember with gratitude the faithful who have guided the next generation. Gather us all as your holy ones into eternal life, risen life in Christ. Dear God, we praise you. It is only good and right that we praise your name for the many blessings we receive. Oh Lord, we thank you this day for the gift of new life as we pray for Adeline and her family as she prepares to receive your gift of baptism. And dear Father, we thank you for the joy and the service that was on display yesterday through the food drive and the many mouths that that will feed. Dear God, we thank you for the way that you bless our families and the way that you bless the church family here. Dear Lord, we trust and we delight in you. And we commend all of our lives into your loving hands. Lord, we bring these prayers to you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. This moment within our worship is our time of offering. We do not in this time pass a collection plate, but we happen to have them on hand. You will find them on either side of the exit as you leave the sanctuary this day. I want to speak to you quickly about this, that in the message today, we're going to talk about a biblical truth that is this, that God cares more about the why than the do. And yet we know this, that often in the life of the church, many hold back from giving because they believe that what they have to offer is of little use. God cares more about the why than the do. And I just encourage you to allow this to allow yourself to give out of a generous heart, allowing the Lord to take care of all things else. We continue now with our gospel reading. 
Would you please rise for the reading of the gospel, which is found in John 15, 1 to 17, where we read, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. You may, may be, be seated.
this is a good day, All right? In baptism, our gracious Heavenly Father frees us from sin and death, and by joining us to the death and resurrection of Jesus, we are born uh, children of a fallen humanity. Uh, by water and the Holy Spirit, we become reborn as children of God, made members of the church, the body of Christ, and living with Jesus and in the communion of saints, we grow in faith, love, and obedience to the will of God. Called by the Holy Spirit. That's okay. That's right. No, I appreciate it. <laughs> Called by the Holy Spirit, trusting in the grace and love of God. Mom and Dad, I ask you, do you desire to have this little girl baptized into Christ? Thank you. Tyler and Crystal, as you bring your child to receive the gift of baptism, you are entrusted with the following responsibilities. To live with her among God's faithful people, to bring her to the Word of God and the Holy Supper, uh, to teach her in time the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, the Commandments, uh, to place in her hands uh, Holy Scripture, to nurture in her faith and prayer, so that she may learn ultimately to trust God, to proclaim Jesus through the things that she says, and the things that she does to care for others and the world that God has made to work for justice and peace. Matt and Kayla, as the godparents, do you promise to help Adeline grow in Christian faith and life? Thank you. And now all of you, people of God, do you promise to support Adeline and to pray for her in her new life in Christ? We do. Thank you. I want to remind you, uh, there are many places in Scripture that speak of this moment. Uh, one of the most precious uh, comes in the 10th chapter of the Gospel according to Mark. They were bringing children to Jesus that he may touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant, and he said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. We continue now with the profession of faith. If Adeline was a touch older, we would have her do this on her own. Uh, but as she is not quite ready uh, to share this out loud, uh, if you would please uh, help her with this. I ask you to profess your faith in Jesus, to reject sin, confess the faith of the church. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? I do. Do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? Do you reject the ways of sin that draw you from God? I reject them. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Please pray with me. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created this world, calling forth life in which you take delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family, and through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river your son was baptized by John and anointed with your Holy Spirit. By the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection you set us free from the power of sin and death, and you raise us up to live in you. Pour out your Holy Spirit, the power of your living word, that those who are washed in the waters of baptism will be given new life. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, both now and forevermore. Amen. All right, Adeline Rose.
was my friend. Slide on over. Here we go. Adel and Rose, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord bless you and keep you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless. <laughs> She didn't like that too much. No. Adel and I apologize, the water's a little cold. Yeah. Father, sustain Adeline with the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forevermore. Adeline, child of God, you have been marked with the cross of Christ sealed with the Holy Spirit forever. Continue now with the lighting of the candle. The candle is, is a custom for us here at St. Paul, a, a local practice, something we do uh, because Jesus is said in Scripture to be the light of the world, and this candle uh, reminds us of Christ. It also reminds us that what we believe at this moment is that this is the gift of new birth. A new beginning. And so the encouragement uh, for the godparents and the family is to keep this candle and on the anniversary of this day uh, to light this candle again in celebration for what God has done here. Adeline, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. O oh God, the giver of all life, look with kindness upon the Father and the Mother of this child, let them rejoice in the gift that you have given them. Make them teachers and examples of your righteousness. Strengthen them in their own baptism so that they may share eternally with their child the salvation you have given to them through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us welcome the newly baptized. Peace of the Lord be with you, Adeline, and with all of you as well. Amen. Congratulations. You. you can blow that out. <laughs> yeah. All right, my younger friends, I just want to talk to you quickly about the lesson for today. How many of you think you ask a lot of questions? Are you question askers? Yeah. That's a good thing. It's not a bad thing, right? What types of questions do you like to ask? Lots of different ones, Lily? Is that what you're telling me? Okay, that's fair. Right? Are we there yet? Right? What's for dinner? Do I have to? You know, I think the most popular question when all of us reach a certain age becomes why? Why? And I have to tell you as a dad, it's the one I never want to have asked because I, I rarely know the answer, right? Uh, that why can be a dangerous question. But this is what I want you to know today as we talk about what it's like to serve the Lord. God is a God who asks why all the time. He cares about our why more than he cares about what we do. God is seeking in our service to him a right heart, that we're doing things for the right reason, out of love for God and love for others. So your why may frustrate moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, but I promise you, it's your why that God loves most. Never forget that. All right, my friends, will you please pray with me? Take your hands and fold them. Take your eyes and close them. You can repeat after me. And dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, the chance to serve you, a heart that loves you, 
Help us to share it with this world. In Jesus' name, name. amen. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior who is Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you ever done the right thing in the wrong way? You're thinking about that. Well, I know this is uh, going to shock you because you hold me in such high esteem, but I've done this before, right? In my blessed two decades of married life, I have learned the danger of not doing things with a cheerful heart. I can tell you, I no longer stomp around when Mrs. Ball asked me to do something around the house I didn't want to do. I learned pretty quickly that's not a good idea. But the bad behavior that I've held on to is that I like to shine a light on all the good things that I'm doing. I'll give you an example. If I happen to get home from work before she arrives home and I have a moment to do something helpful around the house, let's say it's I get home in time uh, to vacuum uh, the bedroom carpet, right? If I happen to have time to do that and I follow through and I do that, then I very nonchalantly position myself to be standing in the bedroom when she walks through the door and just happen to be staring down, gazing at the carpet, right? And when she asks me, what are you looking for? I say, I'm just admiring how lovely the carpet looks today, right? She no longer humors my need for validation, nor does she find this tactic funny, And what I've come to learn, even though I don't always put it into perfect practice, is that the heart behind doing things is greater than the doing things. Let me say this to you when it comes to serving God. I believe the motivation behind what we do is more important than what we do. What I'm saying to you is, I believe that Jesus cares more about you fulfilling the spirit of the law than that your life lives out the letter of the law perfectly. And it's in this belief that I want to remind you of what we've been doing here over the last now several weeks. We are almost halfway through a 40-day challenge It's called the Red Letter Challenge. It is to come to know the words of Jesus and in knowing the words of Jesus to learn how to live them out, to put them into practice. And after everything that we confess Jesus has done for us, the ways in which he serves us, the fact that he has given his very life for us, we are motivated to represent him well in the way that we live our lives meaning we don't follow Jesus for the attention that it's going to get us. We don't serve Jesus for the rewards we think we are earning. Our serving is loving back a God who loves us first. So what I'm suggesting to you is we are not doing this challenge out of a feeling of obligation. We aren't doing this gritting our teeth and just trying to get through it. We are doing this challenge because really at the heart of it all, we are people who love the Lord and we desire to follow him well. So in this study, uh, the author has categorized the teachings of Jesus to his disciples into these five main principles, uh, being, forgiving, serving, giving, going. Right? We, have, we have been to being, and we have spent time in forgiving, and now we move on to serving. And there is a reason for the order. There is a flow to this all. When we are with God, when we spend time in his presence, we are reminded of God's love. When we are reminded of God's love for us, when we experience it again, Also with that love comes his graciousness, his forgiveness. We realize that no matter what we have done, the things that we have left undone, God in his endless mercy is forgiving of us. 
And when we receive his love and forgiveness, we are now motivated to go and put these things into practice. In other words, after Jesus has done all the heavy lifting, we embrace our role to represent him in the way that we live our lives. So serving. Serving is what we're talking about today. And inside of all of us, I believe, we like, we admire the idea of serving. But there is a disconnect between serving as a concept and actually serving. And one of the reasons is simply this. Serving can be inconvenient. Uh, That opportunity where we are called to serve may run right smack up against that opportunity that we had to have a little bit of fun or a little bit of rest or a little bit of me time. That's one of the reasons that service sometimes doesn't come with a smile. Have you heard of a man by the name of Abraham Maslow? Maslow, right, is highly regarded in the psychology world uh, for his uh, theory on the hierarchy of needs. This is something that he uh, put together in 1943, and what it does is it says that people are motivated to achieve certain needs in life, and that certain needs take precedence over other needs. It's, It's typically illustrated through a pyramid, And at the bottom of the pyramid, the most basic needs are our physical needs. These are the needs that must be met first, right? Food and water, heat, uh, things like that. Then then above uh, physical needs, right, become safety needs. We have a need to feel secure, right? Above security comes love, We have a need, we are wired to to need relationships, whether that's basic friendships or or something more in depth. And finally, at the top of the pyramid, in the way that Maslow designed it, is this term called self-actualization, right? Which really just means we have a need uh, to reach our best selves, to feel fulfilled, And that's what he put at the top of the pyramid. And this has served the world of psychology now for decades. But of course, like everything else, once somebody puts forth a theory or a model, everybody else comes with a pencil in hand ready to make edits. And so over time, there have been additions to Maslow's pyramid. And most recently, there is a new top to the pyramid. And it is a term called transcendence. And what transcendence means is this, once I have reached my full potential, once I have reached that self-actualization, then what I truly need in life is to help somebody else do the same thing. That the highest level of fulfillment as a human is to help other people. Meaning that when we serve, when we help somebody else, It brings us the greatest fulfillment that we can have in life. Let me say it this way to you. What psychology has determined is that nothing fulfills you more than serving other people. Because serving others invites you into a life that's bigger than you. God wants to give that richness to our lives. Our purpose, as we study scripture, we come to find out that our purpose always flows out of our identity. And the Bible tells us very clearly that Jesus is a servant of all. And Jesus says to his followers that he came into this world not to be served, but to serve. And so as believers, we have God's spirit residing inside of us, and we are made in his image. And so if, if God in human form is a servant then we represent him best in this world when we're a servant too. This means that we get so much joy out of serving because it's how God made us. It's how he wired us. Being a servant is a part of your identity in Christ. 
Meaning, we're not simply just thanking God, we're stepping into our God-given identity. We see this illustration in the Gospels as Jesus is calling his first disciples. And if you've, if you've read that, you realize just how amazing it is as we see Jesus walking along and calling out to these men who are typically in the middle of a work day. And they drop everything, leave their family behind, and they go and follow him. And we need to consider this, that when Jesus is making this call on their lives, this is Jesus' pre-miracles recorded in Scripture. So what is it about this call that gets total obedience. And I think we need to go back to the call and see what Jesus says. He says, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Meaning that what Jesus is promising them is a new identity. And that out of that new identity, they will be able to shape other people's lives. Use a psychology term that's transcendence one of the reasons though that we struggle with walking in this new identity is because we are people in a culture that actively works against it our culture encourages us to think like a consumer and not a contributor right we are in a culture that values consumption struggles with contribution Think about the way most American businesses operate, right? A company will promote their quality, value, style, service, selection, convenience, savings, performance, experience, low rates, friendly service, name brands, easy terms, affordable prices, money back guarantee, free installation, free admission, free appraisal, free alteration, free delivery, free estimates, free home trials, and free parking. No cash? No problem, no kidding, no fuss, no risk, no obligation, no red tape, no down payment, no entry fee, no hidden fees, no purchase necessary. No one will call on you. No payments until September. And don't forget, pick up your free gift. A classy, deluxe, custom designer, luxury, prestige, high quality, premium, one of a kind, pencil holder. Yours for the asking, no purchase necessary. Why? Because you mean the most of us. You're the consumer. That's the American mindset that has been re repeated time and time again. The customer is always right. Or as the great Burger King once said it, your way right away. Right? This has an effect on us. This consumer focus, this obsession with meeting the needs of the consumer it even shapes the, our family dynamic, the way we interact with one another, how much we expect the focus to come back to me. It, it's gone into our churches. We have consumer-minded churches raising up consumer-minded Christians, people who go out in search of the church that provides them the ideal uh, services, things that they can consume that gives them a worship service that meets their preferred styles and we we understand this because it's what we live in all other aspects of our life the problem is that's not God's call on us as his church see we have been made by God to serve we have been made by God to be people who think about others before ourselves We've been made by God to be part of something that is bigger than us. The church is a movement of people who have been called by God to go and serve other people. That's not your way right away. That doesn't mean you're always right. There's a story in Scripture it's in the fourth chapter of John's gospel account. It's when Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at the well. Are you familiar with this? This is, right? And Jesus coming and sitting and speaking with this woman, this is already, right, countercultural. But in this well-known story, there's a lesser-known part to it. And it's what happens after the woman leaves. Because after the woman leaves, 
Jesus' disciples return. They've been off getting something to eat, right? And John records the conversation they have with Jesus when they get back. John says, meanwhile, his disciples urge him, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus says to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And they say, how can that be? It's Sunday and Chick-fil-A is closed. (laughs) That's horrible. That's horrible. Now, the disciples are baffled by what Jesus is saying. They ask each other, could somebody else have brought him food? They just don't get it. So Jesus explains, my food is to do the will of him who sent me to finish his work. What Jesus is saying there to them is this. When others are consumers and think, fill me, fill me, what nourishes me is when I pour out into the lives of other people. The disciples in that moment were focused on consuming. While Jesus was considering contributing. He looked out and he saw all these people in need. People from all around who were hurting. And as he saw them, he felt more revitalized, more rejuvenated, more filled when he was able to serve them. There's a time to consume. Not all consuming is bad. We began with consuming, being, being with the Lord, hearing his voice allowing him to fill us up and refresh us. There is a time to consume, but there's also a time to do. And I would argue that we have greater fulfillment in contribution than we will ever have in consumption. Because, again, stay with me, if Jesus is wired to feel revitalized and re-energized as he contributes and we are made in the image of God, then we are wired that way too. Psychology tells us this, and Jesus says it. He has made you to serve. And serving has been God's plan since the beginning. You stick with a plan that works. From the very beginning, we have been called to be God's representatives. And at times, at times we've not done this well. We've missed the mark. In Exodus chapter 19, we hear God speaking to the nation of Israel through Moses, and he says this to the people. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Here's what he's saying. He's calling them specifically to represent him for the sake of the rest of the world, not at the expense of the rest of the world. And as Israel would grow, and as they would stay faithful to God, he would make them prosperous, and the world would see what they did, and they would point all glory to their God the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, our God. But if you really know the story, you know it doesn't last long. It's not long before Israel proves to be unfaithful and unfaithful and unfaithful. And so God, in his mercy, sends Jesus into the world to be a model for us of what a life in God looks like. Because where Israel fails, Jesus does not. He lives a perfect life. He fulfills every letter of the law by living out the very love of God. And then when Jesus ascends to heaven, it's Peter, one of his 12 disciples, who says something that echoes very closely with the words first spoken through Moses. But keep in mind, Peter is no longer addressing the nation of Israel. Peter's speaking to you. He is talking to everybody who will follow after Jesus. And this is what he says. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Right? He, he's called us a royal priesthood, a chosen nation. He is saying to us that we are meant to be his light in this world. That's exactly What Jesus calls us in the fifth chapter of Matthew, he says, you are the light of the world. And a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and place it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I bring these scriptures to you to present to you the understanding that this has been God's plan from the very beginning. You are God's plan. The church, uniquely called, uniquely acting, uniquely speaking people, are God's plan. And this is the opportunity, the call, that he has placed on our lives. And did you catch the end of that Matthew passage? Jesus says, when you serve... People may see your good deeds and give glory to your Father who is in heaven, meaning that we have the opportunity in what we do to point people back to God. Through our service, we can bring people to Christ. It means this, right? We cannot save ourselves. There is no amount of good deeds that we can store up to earn our way to heaven. We confess and believe that Jesus has already taken care of our salvation. He has won that for us. So we are not serving here to earn God's love, nor are we serving for the benefit of raising up our name. But if we can really help point people back to what Christ has done in their lives, if we can really use our lives in a way that glorifies God, what this means is that while you cannot save yourself, God can use you to save somebody else. And you were made to serve, and you need to serve. God has wired you this way. It's been his plan from the very beginning. It's what we are made to do. And at this point, I hear some of you inside saying, okay, wrap this up, buddy. I get it. I need to serve. I need to serve, but I don't know where to start. I need to serve, but I don't know what to do. I need to serve... I'm not sure what God has made me for. And I just want to say, if that's you, welcome to church. Welcome to church and understand that's why God places his churches in the middle of communities and not out in the middle of nowhere. He places us here and he gives a call on our lives to go out and serve everyone who isn't here yet. He calls on us to be his unique people working together. And so if you are feeling that calling from God to serve, but you don't know what to do, I believe that's why we're here, to come together, uh, to figure out our strengths and our weaknesses and what is the call of God upon our hearts to serve in this community. Yesterday morning, uh, we had the most wonderful food drive right out here in front of our school. A combination of students and and members from the congregation. Uh, So many mouths will be fed as a result of the good spirit that was there. We happen to have this extra blessing of being a church that has a school ministry. And so what that means for us is that we have a connection to this community that we otherwise would not have. An opportunity to simply serve people that God is placed in our lives outside of here you hang a left you'll find our mission wall on the mission wall you'll see photos of other missions that are near and dear to the heart of the people here at St. Paul if none of that interests you at all then let's talk about what God is calling you to do bring forth what you believe needs to happen in this community and let's figure out how we can do that work of being his church and care for all those in need. I want to uh, end this just by taking us back to that reading from Philippians. Hear what the Apostle Paul writes to us. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. 
Rather, making himself nothing, by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May our service together in this place lift our Savior up high, so that all the community may come to know who he is and give him glory, and in knowing him, that all people may be saved. Amen. We take this moment for a time of silent confession as we prepare our hearts to receive the Lord's Supper this day. As we come before God, as we stand at the foot of the cross, as we hear this call to go out and represent Him in the community, we realize this. All too often we make this whole thing about me. And it is not. As we come before the Lord now, we confess our sins. We give to him those things that we've done that we should not have done. Those things that we have said that we should not have said. Those moments when he called on us to go and we did not go. And all those moments that we've made about me. And as we stand at the foot of the cross, we're reminded that we're coming before a God who chose to lower himself out of love for this world. God, in his great love, sent his one and only Son into this world to do for you and I what we could not do for ourselves. And in living life perfectly and on sacrificing his life at the cross, he has won for us the forgiveness of sins, the gift of new life. It is my great privilege to pronounce to you the forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord took bread. When he given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Thank you. As communion uh, makes its way toward you, just so you know, uh, what we do is we will take and eat, take and drink together. So you will receive that cue from me. But in preparation, you can peel away the top here so that you can get to the wafer.
Take and eat the body of Christ. Take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of sins.
tell the world of the treasure you found. We close out our service now with our sending song, Your Grace is Enough. I want to thank you for worshiping with us this day. Uh, as we are growing in each successive week now, uh, I want to let you know that starting next Sunday, we will have extra seating down in the cafeteria, uh, meaning you can bring snacks and, and have a good time. Uh, but right down here to the left in the cafeteria, uh, you'll be welcome to be there for worship as well as we'll stream what's going on here live down there just to keep us all uh, safely uh, spaced apart. Now as you go, go with his blessing as it comes from the Lord. Now may the Lord bless and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor and give to your heart his peace. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. So remember